I think uh, the, the two talks are going to be quite uh, complementary. Uh, so you have some questions that you're going to have with this talk. I think you had the answer with the talk of Lynn. And I think some questions that you had with the talk of Lynn, you can have some answer with my presentation. So it's, it's, um, it's very nice to have, uh, I would like to thank Victor and Adrien for organizing the fish seminar. I think it's very important. And as Adrien said, it's a long collaboration between France and South Africa for the study of Stone Age. And uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be there and to present my work. I'm also very happy to, to have this uh, seminar with Lynn. And she is one of the, one of the few persons who, uh, over the last two decades, really contribute to change our picture of the Middle Stone Age. Our, our image of uh, these people living there in the late Pleistocene. And now we, are, we have to accept these people were really behaving like us. Even if there are differences, but these differences are related to, the, to their, the system of subsistence. They were hunters and gatherers, and they were also living in another technological world. So it's what I'd like to, to introduce, just some insights into the, the technology. Actually, it's what I do, it's what I like. Uh, taking the example of the site of deep. So you will see a lot of pieces of stone, and when you don't really have the proper knowledge of the stone, they look really dead. But actually, they are really alive, and uh, I want to see this, these pieces as real. They are real pieces, there are people that were there, and it was important uh, for their reality. And I think it's important to study them because it has a lot to say about human evolution. So that's quite big, actually. So I'm going <coughs> to briefly present some principles, how we work uh, when we study the technology. I'm going to briefly introduce the, the framework for the Middle Stone Age. After, uh, I'm going to present the site, some deep proof, just having a, a, a large amount of view. And finally, I'm going to focus on the three different uh, assemblages of the site. And I will start to, to discuss some ideas uh, of changes, because it's what I like about discussing about continuities and discontinuities through time. So at some point, it might be clear on that, but we can discuss about this. So what is about lithic technology really is the basic principle that the, the fracture of the rocks operates through different constraints that dictate the propagation of the fracture. So these are physical constraints. So you have three physical constraints. The first one is the rock property. They have different rocks and they vary in terms of elasticity, uh, dirty, homogeneity, and all are parameters that will uh, co constrain the rupture. The second constraint is a matter of the geometry of the rock. If you want the rupture to be blocked, you need some specific convexities, longitudinal convexity, lateral convexity, also some specific angle. So you need some, some basic understanding of this convexity. The last constraint is uh, the application of the force. And the application of the force is a type of application, so it can be percussion or pressure, it can be direct or indirect. It's the nature of the hammer, its density, its mass, its nature, it can be organic or mineral. And it's also uh, its motion and the force that is applied to the rock. So these rocks, these constraints are really important because once you understood these constraints, they become rules. That means that if you understand these rules, you can play with the rules and you can predict the type of product you can have. That means that you can anticipate and go to a specific objective. And of course, a specific objective is a tool. Huh? I mean, it's, uh, it's simple to say, but that's really important. In terms of global structure, a tool is always an opposition between a passive part and a uh, passive, uh, passive uh, part, passive portion and active portion. So this is the basic structure of a tool. After you have a lot of variability as you can see on this, uh, on these drawings. This has only tools coming from the middle stone age of, uh, of deep proof. But if you, if you take example from other sites, of other regions, other time periods, you will not multiplicate this type of tools, but you have much more variability. And it's what people were looking for. So the most point is what dictates the viability of the tool. It's what we have to understand. So it's just a, a few uh, basic notions in terms of technology. So to understand what dictates the viability of the tool, you have to refer to four main, four main notions. The first one is the notion of efficiency. The tool has to be efficient in action, of course. And uh, efficient notion of efficiency is relative. It depends on the type of activities uh, that you are going to perform, as cutting or scraping, and it's also related to the type of material you are going to do. So it was, uh, it was here the first parameter. The second parameter is the kinetic. Okay? When you use a tool, it's a matter of energy, propagation of energy, and this is related notably to the other technical subsystems, like rafting, for example. 
The other element is a matter of ergonomy. And the ergonomy, the way you use the tool, is actually related to the body technique of the people. And finally, the last element, which is non-utilitarian aspect, which you call it aesthetic, but it's probably not the good word, which is related to the belief of these people. So it's really understand to understand to it's really important to understand what uh, influence, uh, what dictates the viability of the tool. So we characterize the tool, but we also characterize the different steps that people follow to create the tool. So we characterize, we characterize the tool, we characterize the reduction sequences, and together we have what we call the shell operator, which is an analytical tool that you can apply of any type of technical behavior. So you have also variability within the reduction sequence. So the variability of the reduction sequence is first related to the skill of the people. When you speak about the skill of the people, so it's the type of hominids, but also the, the individuals themselves. After, it's related to the geological resources. So it's, it's dependent to the environment of the people. It's also related to the type of economy the people are living. So basically, we know the subsistence system is inter gatherer but that, as you can imagine, you have a lot of variability within this system. And finally, you have the tradition of these people who, who speak in favor of the memory of these people. The memory can be direct or indirect. And so you can access to all these parameters in the archaeological record. It depends, but mostly you can. And what you look for these elements, the memory that we, that we have lost, but it is the memory of these people. So the principle, how we can go back to this system, is because the rocks record all the stigmas. When you have a piece, you know in which, uh, at which stage uh, comes the piece. So you have an idea of the geometry. O optimatically, you have this kind of refitting. So it's a 3D block, so you exactly know when has been detached the piece, what was the role of the products, whatever. But even if you don't have this kind of refitting, you can have an idea of the geometry. You have two other elements. The first one is that you can characterize the rocks, so you can uh, understand where she comes from, so the, the distance and other elements. And finally, you can also have ideas about how they have been used, for which purpose the tool, have, the, the tool has been used. So at the end, when you, are, when you read all the stigmas, you have quite a good knowledge, actually it's a craft, it's a craft knowledge, huh? it's very important, of the clappers and the users, and so you go back to the technological rules of these people. So here, it's, it's nice to say that, but what is the purpose of that? So we have three scales of investigation. The first scale of investigation, so, Studying that is only is always a matter of time. Huh? You look for the time, and after the time operates in space. That's why we manipulate the different scales. So the short term scale relates to the techno-economic behavior. So when we are at the site, we estimate one stratigraphic unit, okay, one sedimentary unit, and we have all the products that are associated that represent one unit of time. Of course, it's composed of multiple events, but it's how we have to deal with, we consider as one unit of time. And so we characterize what are the type of rocks, how they have been introduced, what have been done into the site, what have been exported. So we have quite uh, an overview of the viability of the technology in space. We, 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 we try to understand the, complementary of the, the complementarity of the site. It's quite a taphonomic approach, and this is really influenced by all the ethno-archaeological work. So the second, uh, the second scale is the medium-term scale. So here we deal with the technological tradition. So we characterize the technological behaviors and we see, okay, here we have similarities, here we have differences. When we have similarities, we assume these people were sharing the same technological template. So basically it's one, unit, one other unity of time. After we try to compare within the site, we try to compare with other sites at a regional scale, at a macro-regional scale, and so we see differences, we see similarities, and so it it speaks about bounders in terms and spice, and so it speaks about discontinuities and continuities, which are really the key elements in prison. And finally, the, the last scale is the long-term scale. So the technological changes, we deal with innovations and adaptations. So basically, we have two main dialectics, men and environment, and men and technology. Okay. So I hope it's still uh, OK. It's just uh, to understand, basically, the framework. It's uh, OK, to a question. All these elements, I mean, when you're really interested in technology, it's enough. But after most of the time, you have an historical context. So here we have also an historical context, which is the Middle Eastern Age. And what is the concern of the Middle Eastern Age? Basically, we speak about the history of anatomically modern humans. So they are said to appear uh, at about 200,000 years BP in East Africa and spread through Eurasia at about 60,000 years BP. 
So we try to understand what kind of changes appear in Africa before 50,000 years BP, where, uh, at what rhythm of change, and what are the mechanisms behind. And you see in South Africa, it was pretty clear with the site of Sibudu, you have a lot, a lot of innovations that occur quite precociously in South Africa, and we give a picture of something really innovative. It concerns the symbolic proxies, we have shell beads, we have engravings, but also the technology, we have heat treatment of rocks, we have pressure flaking, we have uh, complex residues that are done, so really something uh, complex. But here's the point that we're really looking for the, for the proxies, and these proxies are related to the paradigm of, of modern human behavior. Okay, sometimes we say, okay, this is modern human behavior, and so we look for specific points. But actually, what we try to develop as, as well yeah, is to have a better understanding of the temporality of the Middle Eastern Age. So what we say, the chronocultural framework, how this technology changes over time, and how they were different in space. So we try to contextualize these proxies to access to the mechanisms and to understand the implications. <laughs> now it's going to be uh, more cool. <laughs> this is the site of, uh, of uh, the Kloof, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, shelter, uh, which is located about 200 kilometers uh, north of Cape Town. So it overlooks uh, the Valorant Clay uh, River, which is there, which makes like a natural dam. It's uh, located about 15 kilometers from the current beaches and about 40 kilometers from the Cedar Bank Mountains. So actually, you have quite a uh, the, the association of different ecological niches uh, close to the site. It's, it's, it's a beautiful area. Yes. So here it's a, a, a 3D scan of the shelter. So the floor is about 250 square meters. Um, the sedimentation at the site probably started at the time of the collapse of this large uh, boulder, which also preserved the site from the erosive agents. And that's why we have the deposits uh, within the cave, within the shelter. So the estimation start, started in, uh, in the early uh, 70s. The site was discovered by John Parkington from uh, the University of Cape Town. And there was a first test pit there, a second test pit there in the 90s. And after, uh, Jean-Philippe Rigaud from the University of Bordeaux uh, contacted John Parkington from UCT. So they started a collaboration that started in 1998. And this year is going to be the last year of excavation at the site, so it's, it's quite specific, even if I'm quite uh, confident that we will at some stage go back to the site. So here, because we, what are the purpose when we start to excavate? Because of course there is a strategy of excavation. And the first strategy always is to under, understand the dynamic of sedimentation into the site. Because it's what will, um, will determine the quality of the, uh, of the information, the resolution of the information. So it will give you the resolution of the time that you are studying. So it's really important. And the second point was to explore uh, the column of the sequence. Right? We are looking for the, for the sequence. So of course it's a project that uh, involves a lot of people, uh, colleagues and, and friends for most of them. And I'm happy to, to present just some of them. So here is Pierre Texier, it's uh, the site director. It's my boss actually, it was. Here is Christine Verma, at the time the Valorant Clay was uh, over floating, she's a specialist of uh, human remains. Michel Grenet, uh, our drawer, so all the, the drawings that you see are from Michel. Christopher Miller, uh, micromorphologist. Chantal Tribolo, our luminescence uh, specialist, so she does OSL and TL dating. Aurore, that you know from this, just finishing her PhD on Fauna remains. And Lord Ayer, specialist of uh, ochre remains and other people that, okay. I'm happy that you can see the people because it's something really uh, alive, right? <laughs> so, you see from Sibudu, it looks very similar. Also, there is some differences. This is all looks like the deposit, the upper part of the deposit and the sequence of the proof. This is a, an accumulation of uh, fine lenses, black and white, which are related to some types of combustion activities. Some are, are small earths, some are uh, uh, hash dumb, some other are beddings. So basically, yeah, all these elements are related to, uh, uh, to anthropogenic activities. Here we have quite a break in the sedimentation, so we really can see that uh, at some stage people started to occupy the site in a different way. So above that, the geogenic component, uh, notably the quartz coming from the disaggregation of the shelter, is much more important, even if we have some isolated earths within this area. It's quite similar to see the future. Here are the few artifacts that you can find. So uh, you can see, I mean, the, the preservation is quite exceptional, as it is at Sibudu, but it is not the norm. It's very rare. We have to be aware that it's really exceptional for the two sites. 
So you have a lot of charcoal seeds, a different kind of funeral remains. So you have uh, shells, turtles, uh, many turtles, many many turtles, and mammals. So I mean, so we have a good, uh, we can have a good picture to reconstruct the paleontological uh, record through the time. But what we can see also is that people all along the time always selected, uh, always exploited different ecological niches. They were never uh, specified. Here we have some uh, some ochre uh, pieces. We don't know what was uh, the purpose of the use of ochre, but what we can see is that they were looking for ochre powder. And here also a few artifacts from uh, the Obison sport is just to see, as you can, as you have seen before, this game at Sigudu, that you have the preservation of residues uh, uh, on, the, on the pieces. And this one has been uh, analyzed uh, uh, chemically by Armel Charrier from Strasbourg at the CNRS. And the species has been, has been uh, individualized, so it's, uh, it's uh, yellow, it's Podocarpus and So you can see that the, the knowledge we have seen is really accurate. And it's quite impressive because at the end, the picture we can get is, is very impressive for this time. And probably the most important, not the most important, but the most striking discoveries at the site is the presence of ostrich eggshell. So ostrich eggshell is present all over the sequence. They, they could have been introduced into the site for, for consumption, that's, that's pretty sure. But at some stage, they have been used for, for containers. So these one are uh, later stone age containers. Huh? They are not from the proof. But actually, we have evidences of containers. And some of them were engraved. So it's, it's, it's quite spectacular and actually corresponds to the oldest graphic tradition that is, that is currently known in the, for humanity. So it's something quite big actually when you think about it. And so how we can say that? We say that because uh, we have a very few number of motifs. They were very normalized. And also we have changes through time. At the base of the sequence, we can imagine uh, the, the ostrich eggshells that were used as counting, as a container, that were engraved in its equatorial axis with a hatchet band. And after, in the upper part of the sequence, they were engraving uh, sub-parallel lines in the longitudinal axis of the line. So we can see that we have a change in motif, but also a change in the geometry of the, of the egg itself. And it's something really big, actually. So now, we come back to the, to the lithic uh, technology. This is a sequence of deep proof. It's dated by Chantal Tribolo, by uh, TL and OSL, to 110,000 BP to 50,000 uh, years uh, BP. So here it's the uh, main uh, technological phases that we can uh, individualize. We will just uh, focus on these uh, three phases of the process. So I'm just going to present uh, the, the, technologi the technological uh, uh, complex of these, uh, these societies, but I will also try to put them in the context of the raw material economy. Uh, because they select rocks, they transport rocks, so we have to understand the geological environment of this population. So over the West Coast, we, select, we, we sampled about uh, 60 uh, different outcrops. It's mostly secret in our context. Some of them present convergences in terms of uh, macroscopic features. But you can see that there are also some differences that we can figure out in space. So we try to put the balance between the two. So we start with the MSMAC. At the proof, we use names to, uh, to, uh, to individualize the stratigraphic unit. Sometimes it's letters, sometimes it's numbers. At Sibudu, it's acronyms. So yeah, it's a tradition coming from the West Coast and coming from UCT, and actually it works pretty well. So we call it the MSM mic. So for these uh, two stratigraphic units, the most striking elements is people are looking for triangular track. So it's, it's quite important, it was their main tool. And you have two reduction sequences to get to this triangular element. The first one, what we call the level of system, is something that uh, appears in different contexts in the world at different times. I mean, it's frequent to find them in the Middle East, it's frequent to find them in, in Western Europe, we find also them in South Africa. So it's quite important because we deal with the notion of technological convergence. And something that is really important for technology. So here, just to show you, here is the product, here is the core, where come from these products. So just to show you, the point is that you have two removals that converge, that create this triangle of bars, and actually the, the rupture will follow this convexity. And so you prepare your angle, you facet your platform here on your core, and after you get this product. So here, another example, I choose this one because they are the same, but you can see that you have also differences. But we have also always to make the, dif the difference between the intention and the, and the realization. So it's when we study the assemblage, we have to make that one. And actually, when we consider this product, for me, there are triangular elements, even if they don't have a triangular morphology. 
but actually you have a wrong, you cannot see, you have a wrong preparation of the distal convexity, that means that the force has been uh, far away, but actually the point was there for the two. This is just a te technical observation. This is probably the, the for me what's uh, really excited with that. They are really specific, but you can see that they are really normalized. Uh, they are all the same. And we escaped this, this, this uh, unit last year. They are really, really characteristic. So we call them accursive points, whatever. Uh, they are character co compared to the other one, it has a, a, a trapezoidal section. Those ones are always a triangular section. Most of the time, it has a cortical side. And you have all the facets of the platform. So you have variability in shape. But the, the shape operatoire is always the same. Here, example of the core. Here, example of accuracy point. So here, first, you have one removal, as you can see, that creates this ridge that the, the, the rupture will follow. After, you, you prepare your platform here on the core, and after, you detach your product with a specific advanced percussion. And here, you can see that you have exactly the same product, but, at the, um, but the, the, this core has been discarded before to get the point, just because, I mean, I presume, that there was a bad preparation of the complexity because you have a fault here in the rocks. So I'm going to finish with this unit, but, uh, just to see how, how works uh, the study of lithium technology. So we have triangular flake. We have also, together with that, laminar products. Uh, they are elongated and super products. They are not very well normalized because of the technique. It's mostly hard hammer percussion without preparation of the platform. And finally, we have flat production. Two elements that are important to know for this industry when we're going to go to the other industry is the first one that all the pieces are raw. They are not retouched. Okay? The percentage of retouches is very, very rare. We have few denticulates, but very rare. And the second element that people mostly, mostly exploit local works. So that we are available in the shelter, quartz site and quartz. Okay. So here we are going into one stratigraphic unit above this MSMI. This is the Prestig Bay of Euclidean. And actually, it's uh, only one scientific unit, and you have a low number of pieces. We observe the same uh, elements, uh, except so triangular flex, blade, and flex, except that they are much less normalized. It's quite difficult to, to see uh, clearly normalization. But the main change is associated with the rocks. We see now finer grain rocks coming from distances greater than 20, 30, 40 kilometers, and all these rocks are heavily retouched. Uh, so we have a change in the mobility, the raw material processing strategies of this population. So it's another economy. And we can see that some products have a double patina. For example, these products here and here have been discarded and have been reused. So it's really quite a complex economy. Some of them being used as tool and as core. Okay, it's just... And also what we observe, so here you can see that the shape of the tool here is, is done by complete unifacial shaping. So you can get the morphology of the flake before upstream when you make the complexity of the block or you can get it downstream and in that case it's downstream with also some bifacial shaping at the base probably for rafting or anything. Okay, it's almost finished. We're going to describe the, the next unit which is called the steel bed that we also heard from the CBDU. It's five stratigraphic units. So it's a complete technological change. Now you can see that uh, it's based on the bifacial reduction sequence. So you have the block and you sculpt the block to get your tool. Huh? So it's a different concept. And here are the, the typical flex coming from this shaping. Here it's a circuit <coughs> from uh, about 10 kilometers from the deep loop, just to sh show you uh, the basic principle of shape operatoire. In that case, they have large flex, and after you shape with hard hammer stone uh, bilaterally, bis bis bi uh, bilaterally and bifacially. After you get to uh, you try to skin the PC and to get the final morphology. All of them are broken when they are staged because of the thickness of the product, they are very uh, thin. So this is how it looks like the big fascia pieces, but all of them are broken. It's, it's broken uh, mostly during resharpening. That means that these tools were used and were resharp, were used and were resharp. And you can see as well that some of them uh, were, after being used, were used as core. So they are completely uh, transformed, but you cannot use them anymore. And you look for the type of products that, that were there. And the, the products coming from these bifacial pieces were also used as tool. And it's shipping flags that were retouched, so you can see it's a complex economy. And you have also some shipping flags. Here it's an arm face, but we have no bifacial pieces in arm face, so it's potentially somewhere else in the site. 
But it just goes out of that to see that the, the technical economy was really complex. They were introducing rocks from, uh, from non-local areas. They were curating these rocks. They were moving with these rocks. So it's quite similar to the preceding pristine. OK, so just to conclude, so we just have an idea of how, uh, what we can say from this succession. And after, I'm going to conclude with the obvious sport, uh, just uh, general ideas. Alors, the change from the MSMA that we've seen from the Presti Berlin is a real change in the raw material economy. We have the production of flake, of triangular is the same, except that we have more non-local rocks that they were created. So the main change is the way people were organized in the territory. And the second change, actually, because we see, a, we see similar techno-economical patterns from this element to this element, except that now we have the technological innovation, which is the bifacial piece. So we define a scenario for continuous change. That means that the, in that case, the technological innovation follows techno-economic adaptation. And the Christy Berlin, which is only one stratigraphic unit, only 400, 500 pieces, would represent a technological transition. We will say the word liaison, but I don't know what it is. And the spark as the origin of this change is actually related to a modification of the territorial and socio-economic organization of the population. But the cause can be internal, it can be a change in demography, a change in socio-economy, or it can be external, so related to a modification in the environment, in subsistence, or a modification in the access of the resources. And finally, the steelbed technology might represent, because it occurs after the, the spark, might represent a trend towards the normalization of the blank in the framework of a new territorial organization. But if you accept that, you accept, you accept the fact that technology also operates by its, by, by its own rules of evolution. So that's going to be the last slide. So just to wonder what is above the steel bay. Actually, what is above the steel bay is a completely different industry that we call the obvious sport. And the obvious sport challenges all the prehistorians in South Africa. It's something really quite incredible, and you have a lot of behavioral proxies that appear with that. You can see that you have a, this is a, a scheme from Sylvain Soriano from Crisis River. But at the proof, it's exactly the same geometry that we observe. So it's something really normalized, looking for this kind of product with a with soft hammer stone percussion, so it's another technique. And people were doing bitruncated pieces, like the same you've seen at Sigudu, and they were also using uh, glue to have these pieces. So in terms of technology, it's a real discontinuity. In terms of economy as well, because before, we interpret the change as a, we interpret the non-local rocks as a byproduct of mobility. Here it's a clear selection of circuits which represent 50 percent and which was the parameter of their technological uh, context. So we have a clear uh, discontinuity except the presence of a few bifacial pieces within these elements. So what means this discontinuity? So it's really an innovative technology, it really fascinates a lot of people. Uh, this discontinuity can be associated with a dramatic change in environment. Something, some scenario catastrophic, but actually we have no uh, no uh, record of this dramatic change in the bioenvironmental uh, record of the uh, period. We have no clear uh, observation of such a bioenvironmental change in the archaeological world. It can also be some new population that came. And this is actually what is the dominant model. That means that it, will, it means that this change, this type of innovative behavior, would be associated with some specific groups within modern humans. Okay? But the change doesn't always come from, from somewhere else. And sometimes, we have also to interrogate, because we don't have this obvious sport in Central Africa or East Africa. It might be a problem before, but for now, we don't have it. Actually, what it, it, it uh, forces us to interrogate our own theoretical framework of technology. Innovation, by definition, if you go to the philosophy of techniques, is a revolution, is discontinuous. And the point is that when we study one uh, piece of stone, we have to put them in, uh, in interaction with the other stone, but we have also to put them with what precedes and what succeeds. And what we have to understand when we want to deal with the business world is to understand what was the potential of evolution of the preceding steel bed. Thank you very much.